Welcome everyone to Learn at Lunchtime. So glad you guys can join us today. So right now I'm gonna turn this over to my fellow colleague here, our program director at the State Museum, Bradley Smith. All right, thank you, Sherry. And thank you to everyone joining us in person and through the internet. This is an exciting bit of an experiment we're trying. We appreciate everyone being here with us. Our program today is called The Phenomenon of the Parachute Wedding Dress during World War II. And our speaker is going to be Katie McGowan. Katie has been with the State Museum for about seven years as a curator. And we're very fortunate to have her on our staff because she brings with her expertise in historic clothing. And that really comes invaluable uh, as we manage our collection at the State Museum. We also have a very special guest uh, joining us also in a little bit will be Wendy Willard Barkas. She and her family donated the dress to us and we'll be asking her some questions about her, her family and, and their memories of the dress. I will now turn it over to Katie and uh, she'll be presenting some slides to everyone. Katie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brad. I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me. So today, we're going to be talking about the phenomenon of the parachute wedding dress in World War II. And I'm opening with this great quote from Marie's bridal diary. Um, after months of separation and a marriage proposal that consisted of a mailed engagement ring, Marie was set to marry her fiance, Warren Willard. It was 1946. Warren had just been discharged from the army while Marie had remained at home uh, doing a bookkeeping job in Millersburg, Dauphin County. And she writes in her diary that June 16th, 1946 was a lovely day for a wedding. There was a sky of heavenly blue and not a cloud in the sky to mar its beauty. And this is a photograph from their wedding day on the left. Marie's wedding dress was simple, elegant, and made from a very unusual material. It was actually a recycled military parachute. So today I'm going to be talking about the phenomenon of the parachute wedding dress and what led to this practice during World War II and talking about how prevalent was the practice and what did it say about the brides that chose to wear dresses made from this material. How did rationing during World War II extend to the apparel industry and how did fashion respond to that? So we're gonna talk, be talking about these questions more in depth um, as we go on. So we're all familiar about the rationing that occurred during World War II in terms of food. Um, these are, in 1942, the Emergency Price Control Act granted the Office of Price Administration authority to set limits on how much goods the average family could consume in a month and created ration tokens and stamp books to be used to redeem for food. Blue tokens were for canned goods and red ones for meat and dairy. Customers were limited to 48 blue stamps and 64 red stamps per person per month and all food items were ranked using this point system. The more desirable items cost more points and therefore used up the greatest number of the monthly stamp allotment. So people had to get creative. Um, you can see here on the left is a ration book um, in our collection. Um, and you can see the blue and red tokens here. And on the right, a chart showing how the point system was divvied up. Now canned goods were some of the most high demand items just because the um, aluminum was being reserved for military use. So one can of peas would have cost you 16 of your tokens. Um, but that's with food. So what's going on with clothing during this time period? That same year in 1942, the War Production Board announced rationing regulations that would also affect the textile industry. And these became known as Limitation Order 85 or L85. In the order, certain stylistic details and fashionable choices were prohibited in order to conserve the necessary supplies and materials for the war effort. This included many things that were used to adorn clothing, such as balloon sleeves, 
um, skirt hems of excessive circumference and skirt lengths, dolman sleeves, which required more fabric in general, um, selling three piece sets of clothing together at one price, which I think is a very unusual thing to regulate, but there, there we are. Zippers and elastics were also part of this. Um, so we can see on the left an image from Women's Wear Daily showing what the size limitations were. This is for a size 16 women's dress. Um, you'll note that the waist measurement on that size in those, in those standards was 25 inches. So this would have fit probably um, a, small, a small woman today. So the total dress, dress length could be 43 inches only and she was limited to 78 inches for her skirt. Um, the newspaper article on the right there is showing the slimming down of fashion as it became known. So what are women's clothing, how are, how are they changing pre-war and during the war? So this is an example of a sewing pattern from McCall's from 1938. Um, in general, dresses from the 30s and early 40s are already kind of slim and narrow. Um, we can see on this example, the bat wing sleeves on both of these dresses. That was something that got banned by the start of the L85 regulations. And I have another example here from McCall's again, 1941. Um, the dress on the left featuring the French cuff, which was on the banned list. And the dress on the right with the balloon sleeves and kind of an excess of that ruffled trim, which likely wouldn't have been approved. Um, after this order was issued. Contrasting those examples with this one, which would have debuted after these regulations went into effect, this is a Butterick sew sewing pattern. And we can see here that there's a shift um, in these women's coveralls to a very masculine tailored look. This is utilitarian fashion at its finest. You have a lot of women entering the workforce during this period to um, fill vacated jobs, and the woman on the right is even holding a wrench. Um, so these are small industry changes um, in the long term, but in the short term, we're, we're slightly different than what people were used to. One notable exception to the L85 regulations was bridal wear, and there was a reason for that. The magazine Life reported in their June 1942 issue that bridal expenses were expected to increase by 50% that year with an estimated 1,600,000 couples tying the knot. The magazine said that this increase could be explained by sentimental wartime fervor, which loosens the purse strings of friends and relatives of furlough brides, and bulging pay envelopes in war industry towns. The Bridal Manufacturers Association had successfully lobbied Congress to not regulate bridal wear during the war. Their reported argument for this was that the American boys are fighting for the privilege of getting married in the traditional way. And also it went without saying they were also protecting the lucrative industry that they had spent the last 50 years building up. So what was that traditional way that they were protecting so fiercely? We all know that brides didn't always wear white to their wedding, whether that was through economic limitations, practical sensibilities, or family tradition, the rise of the white wedding was actually a fierce marketing strategy by the bridal industry going as far back into the 19th century through the early 20th century. And this is coming to brides through mass marketing efforts. Um, so this, these mass marketing efforts, including magazines, advertisements, things like that, pushed this idea of a fairy tale white wedding through imagery, pop culture, uh, materials that were available to brides, and society's emphasis on adhering to what was fashionable. This is a image of a magazine in, in the State Museum's collection. It's called the Bride's Reference Book. It does post-date the war slightly. It dates to 1950. But this was like the ultimate um, guide for the new bride to inform her on the best things to request for wedding gifts um, to furnish her new household. 
And magazines like these were popular even back into the 19th century and really became a hallmark of the bridal industry. And that carries on to this day even. Bridal wear wasn't regulated or rationed as strictly as other products during the war. But nevertheless, we do see ample representation of brides choosing to be conscientious for their weddings. One of these is through the phenomenon of the parachute wedding dress. We don't quite know how Marie and Warren acquired the parachute, but my colleague Brad was going to share a little bit about what he found about how Warren may have acquired this parachute. Thank you, uh, thank you, Katie. We've uh, chatted with members of the family. We've also looked at military records and we don't have a clear answer. We know that he was in Europe for about 15 months. And um, we know some of the jobs he did. He was, for example, a clerk uh, for a time in charge of processing mail. And while he was doing that, he had actually a large staff. He had 10 enlisted soldiers underneath him and two civilians underneath him. So he was someone that had a fair degree of responsibility. We also know that there's a photograph in the family's possession where he's posing next to a crashed German airplane. And there's some thought, well, maybe he acquired the parachute from that airplane. One of the questions we've considered is, is it possible that it was just an American parachute? Because certainly the Americans had parachutes available. And there's some thought that that would not have been the case because prior to World War II, most of our silk was actually coming from Japan. After Pearl Harbor, that supply of silk stopped. So the, the US Army was making parachutes out of nylon. So the fact that this is made out of silk makes us think that the assumption, the belief that this was from a German parachute, that, that does make a certain degree of sense. But we, we just don't know for sure. And um, so it remains a little bit of a mystery. There are no defining marks that would say this is definitively silk from Germany, from a German parachute. So we're just not sure. Thank you for sharing that, Brad. I had one anecdote to add to that, that some brides are known to have snatched the parachutes right off the battlefield. Um, one British bride, for example, had a plane go down in her backyard, and that is how she acquired her parachute for her wedding. So it could be any number of things. And I love this quote that Marie writes about her dress. My gown had a real story. Um, so she employed a local seamstress to help her skillfully turn the parachute into the wedding gown that you see before you. Her slip underneath is also made from the parachute silk and her veil headband incorporates the nylon draw cords, which have been braided together in a tiara headband. Her dress also incorporates the original seams of the parachute as much as possible with only minimal piecing, which does require a good amount of skill um, to pull off. This was the decade of dresses being cut on the bias or at a diagonal, and this would make the garment more close fitting to the body's natural lines and curves. Marie's dress and slip also included a zipper, which was likely recycled off of another garment um, the regulations didn't prohibit the adulteration of existing garments um, and in fact encouraged the practice of recycling as much as possible. This image here is of a magazine to instruct people on how to do just that. It's called Make and Mend for Victory. Um, this is actually my grandma's copy. Uh, so this magazine, which would have been widely available to the public at the time, had tutorials on how to recycle your clothing to um, get around some of those regulations that the mass production, mass industry of the textile world was seeing. And some of the tutorials in here include instructions on how to um, cut down old men's shirts and suits in order to make women's clothing and children's clothing. 
Why did brides want the parachute silk? We have a couple reserved parachutes from World War II in our collection. This is one of them. We have a camouflage version. Um, they were usually that cream off-white color, but there were camouflage ones as well. And from the outset, the parachute silk seems like it would be super fragile, but it's actually really durable. During World War II, some parachutes were made from a brand new substance, which was nylon, like Brad said. Nylon had debuted at the 1939 World's Fair and was most commonly found in women's stockings leading up to World War II. But by the time the Americans became involved in the war, almost all of that nylon production was being diverted um, to parachute production. The US was unable to trade with Japan for raw, raw silk and that had necessitated a quick pivot to nylon. Nylon was being a synthetic material was strong, flexible, fire resistant and lightweight. So it was a perfect material choice for parachutes. And back home, women that were unable to purchase nylon stockings had to come up with some creative alternatives. And there's even reports of riots and fist fights breaking out in Pittsburgh, for example, over a supply of just 13,000 pairs of stockings delivered to one department store. So if you found yourself in possession of an entire parachute of this material, it would have seemed incredibly luxurious at the time. And of course, once a parachute had been used in any way or even damaged, um, it would have been decommissioned and ineligible for use by the military. So we think that the military did have quite a bit of surplus parachutes. Usually they were also undyed, either white or off-white, like I said, which was that preferred color for the ideal wedding dress. I do know of one surviving example where a parachute was dyed light pink for a bridesmaid's dress. So we have waste not, want not in this period. Marie was not alone in her choice to wear a parachute wedding dress, though we have yet to determine just how prevalent this practice was. Um, there are several documented survivors in museums all over the globe, um, indicating that this was a more widespread practice than just a one-off. Um, it's likely many of these dresses still remain in private possession given how recent World War II was and the descendants that may still have these gowns. And it is also fascinating to see that through the same material, there were a lot of different interpretations of the parachute wedding dress. So this one here is one in the Smithsonian's collection. It was worn by Ruth Hensinger and her husband had used his parachute as a life preserver and a blanket after his plane was shot down. Ruth designed her dress to mimic the one worn in the opening scene of Gone with the Wind. So it's a poofy Scarlett O'Hara dress. Gone with the Wind, of course, coming out in 1939 would have been a pretty recent pop culture reference to this time. So in conclusion, the parachute wedding dress is a really fascinating phenomenon for study into wartime rationing, um, the apparel and bridal industry, as well as just getting a little snapshot on the practicality that many brides had to face in the wake of the second war. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Brad, who is going to introduce Wendy to us all. Thank you very much, Katie. That was excellent and so fascinating. We are going to have, uh, in a moment, I'll ask Wendy to come up and uh, we'll ask her some questions. And then we'll open up the floor for some questions to either our virtual attendees or our in-person attendees. And then finally, one of the last things we will do is we're gonna use an iPad to share some close-up views of the dress so in particular, for those of you at home, uh, if you uh, can stay with us a few more minutes, you've got a chance to see the, the dress up close. And uh, Katie and Wendy will speak a little bit more about that. Katie, could you please uh, unshare your screen now? Thank you. And uh, I'd like to invite Wendy Willard Barkas to join us.
Thank you, Wendy. It's very good to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. Katie, uh, I understand you have some questions for Wendy, so I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, thank you for being here today, Wendy. Um, super low stakes questions here. We were just super interested to hear, um, what are your memories of the dress growing up? Well, I'm the youngest of four siblings and we knew about the dress. We knew it was in the back of mom's closet. We knew we were not to touch it. Um, it was always there, but it wasn't, you know, prevalent that we talked about it every day or anything like that. Yeah. Um, do you recall your parents ever talking about how they acquired that parachute? I don't remember my father uh, discussing it with us, but my mom was very proud of the fact of where it came from and that dad brought it home from the war. Um, and later, you know, it, when you're young, you don't think about these things and you don't realize the importance and how special they are. But when you get older, then you think, oh, I wish they were here to ask questions. And unfortunately, both my parents are deceased. So I'm not able to do that. <laughs> were you ever tempted to try it on or did any of your other family members use the dress in their wedding ceremonies? I was never uh, tempted to try it on. I followed mother's instructions not to touch it. <laughs> but my older sister, Patricia, chose to wear it to impress the neighborhood kids one day. <laughs> and my mom came home from work and found her in the dress. And it, I think that's why no. time she was disciplined. But um, I don't think any of us nor my nieces or granddaughters could even fit into the dress. It's so tiny. So no, we've never wore it. Great, That's we can thank you for that careful care of it so that we can share it with everybody today. Brad, did you want to, um, Wendy, you were telling me about some of the little details on the dress. Mm -hmm. Um, such as the tatting around the sleeves and were, were there any other special features that you wanted to point out on the dress? Well, as you mentioned, the cord of the parachute was fashioned into uh, the veil. Um, it's very special. It's beautiful. The seamstress was in her 70s when she uh, fashioned or made the gown with my mom's, I guess they came up with the design. The ruffles are just beautiful. It's so elegant looking and the tatting around the, the uh, ruffles and the sleeves are just so intricate. It's just amazing that a 70 year old woman would have been able to fashion something so beautiful. And to this day, it's still lovely to look at. Yeah. And to our virtual audience, we will be sharing those features in just about five minutes. I have a question I was going to ask. Um, do you happen to recall, and, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, do you happen to recall ever hearing if your father sent the parachute home specifically to make the dress, or did he send it home and then your mother had the idea afterward? No, it was my understanding from mom that it was sent home specifically for her wedding dress to be made. Oh, wow. from. Yes. Mm. Yes. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can now open the floor to any questions from our audience. If people joining us in person have questions, the virtual audience, which has grown very large actually, will not be able to hear you. So if you would ask any questions you might have, I'll repeat them into my microphone so folks at home can hear us. But are there any questions from our audience in person? And if there's any questions from our audience at home, please uh, enter them into the Q&A box. Yes. I, I missed what you said about the veil. What was it made from? The, the cord of the parachute. If you, you can see the, the it was braided. Part. Yeah, okay. the tiara or what, it, for, okay. the tiara is it the, the um, material for the veil is attached to that, yes. Any other questions? Okay, yes. So, Wendy, thank you for sharing today.
today and sharing the historic collections. I'm just wondering, something you just said that your father said was specifically for the wedding dress. Do you have any sense that he knew of other people doing that? It sounds like it was a phenomenon, perhaps. In my research, it and what Katie um, shared with the Smithsonian dresses, it was common for soldiers to do this. Um, my dad was not a romantic, so I'm thinking, and they were very practical, a very practical couple. So I'm thinking that that was his intention all along, you know, send it home for the dress to be made from it, so. I can add to that. I can add to that a little bit um, that there wasn't, necessarily um, press. The question, if anybody didn't hear that, was was Warren aware of the parachutes being used for wedding dresses at the time? And I would say that there wasn't any kind of mass marketing effort being done to say, take these parachutes and make your wedding gowns out of them. But it's exactly what Wendy said, is that there was this general sense of practicalness that a lot of our ancestors had during these times where they see this huge length of fabric and why would you waste it? Um, especially with it being so rare at the time, um, people were having a lot of trouble acquiring just basic um, needs like that. So I think that it definitely comes from a sense of practicality, but also you often see these parachute wedding dresses being used in a symbolic way as well, where in the case of the Smithsonian dress, that parachute had saved her spouse's life. Um, so there is a little bit of that coming into it, as well as just being practical. We have some more questions from the room and from virtual. Uh, I'm going to go next to a virtual question. Someone in our audience asks, was this a World War II phenomenon or are there documented dresses from other wars? It's a great question. I like that question a lot. Um, so we see this most often occurring with World War II parachutes, primarily because that was the first war in which parachutes were used um, in, in great numbers. I do know of some people using the parachutes to create dresses way after the fact of World War II. I saw one styled to the 1980s where a woman had used her father's parachute and made a dress 40 years after the fact. Um, so I don't know that we have many modern examples um, of dresses styled in that way, but you can see it's a very timely response to the war itself that you see so many of these parachute wedding dresses dating to that World War II period because it's just fresh in people's memory and, and um, it's just uh, the easiest thing to do at the time for many people. Okay. Do you have a question, Amy? I was wondering, do we know what materials are in the, in the fabric? Is it just silk or is it silk and nylon or are there, is there anything else? Let me repeat that question for the virtual audience. We were asked, is the material just silk or are there other materials as well? Um, well, we would have to test the dress to answer that definitively. We would have to lab test what the actual fibers contain. Um, nylon is obviously a synthetic material. Silk is a natural material. So I think the only way to really prove what it is made of would be to test it. And I don't think that's something we'd want to do. <laughs> My mother always insisted it was 100% silk and it was white over the years. It's yellowed a bit. And we can definitely see that in the wedding photo that we shared right at the beginning. It is very white. We have another virtual question. Any idea how much seamstresses would have charged to design and sew a dress like this from a parachute? I'm not really sure. I don't know if your mom, Wendy, ever discussed how much they paid for that. I don't remember her saying anything about what she charged. Um, can't imagine the price it would have been. Yeah. Unfortunately, these questions that are 
being asked now, I wish I would have thought to ask in my younger years when my mom was still alive. So encourage people, I encourage people, ask your parents if they're still alive, if you have things, they're so precious, you know, as, as your parents are precious. Absolutely. Um, a comment, someone says, uh, someone suggests that this spirit of practicality was probably born out of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And that's a very logical observation. And I think that era of the depression then going into the era of wartime rationing, it just, it really does provide a historic context that yes. makes sense that we see this. Yes. Another question from online, were all parachutes intended to be used only once? Brad, do you have any knowledge about that from the military aspect of it? I believe parachutes were reused unless they were damaged. Yeah, that would be my sense as well. And, and also we can see that parachutes were reused, but perhaps in non-militaristic ways. Um, people are reusing the material itself and not just with wedding dresses. I, in my, the course of my research, I have seen that these parachutes were cut up to make all kinds of products, um, purses, pajamas, all kinds of things, quilts. Um, so we're not just seeing the parachutes reused as wedding dresses too. Right. Do we have any other questions from, oh, yes, go ahead. How did you keep it in such a beautiful condition and do you guys have any tips for other people to preserve your historic lifestyles? Oh, that's a good, good question. You'll have to repeat that. Yes, we were asked, and this is a, a question for both Wendy and Katie, I think. One is a, a question for Wendy. How were, was the family able to keep it in such great condition? And a question I think for Katie, what is advice you would give on people at home on how they can preserve their historic textiles and dresses and clothing? Well, my parents were not wealthy. So it literally hung within my mom's closet in the back of the closet with a bag over it. And that's sad, but again, they lived through the depression, World War II, and I don't, remember that preservation of wedding dresses happening in that time. You know, it does today, but it's, that's what's so beautiful about it. It's, it wasn't preserved professionally and it's still beautiful. So. Right, and in terms of, you know, preserving your historic clothing items at home, the biggest hurdles to keeping a textile in good condition are light and temperature and humidity and also keeping pests away. Um, so having it in a dark closet with a bag over it is actually a really good storage solution. Um, attics and basements are not textiles friends. Uh, you also need to frequently monitor for bugs that are attracted to clothing items like carpet bugs and silver fish. Um, we don't generally recommend using mothballs anymore, but if you periodically, you know, inspect the item just to make sure that there's no debris left behind by any pests, you can easily clean those up with uh, a vacuum cleaner with pantyhose wrapped over the nozzle so you're not sucking up any material into your vacuum. Um, and just making sure to keep that humidity and temperature at a relatively consistent um, temperature, uh, just making sure that moisture is not getting in there and light and things like that. That's very good advice. Thank you, Katie. Um, we have another question. This one's a little bit uh, getting into the broader context of World War II rationing. And I'm not sure if I know offhand the answer to this, was there much counterfeiting of ration tokens and cards? It's a really interesting question. And I don't know that I read enough into the rationing to know, but I know that there were um, texts on the ration cards themselves saying, 
you know, these are to be redeemed solely for, there were like penalties and fines listed there. Um, so it was sort of the equivalent of, of money. I'm, I'm sure that there were cases of people borrowing other people's books, but y your name was on that book and it would have been considered kind of like identity fraud in a way. If you had taken somebody else's book, you were supposed to report thefts of your ration books right away. There was all kinds of information located within the, the books themselves on how they were legally allowed to be redeemed. So I can't really talk to the scale of which that happened, but I just know that it was advertised on them not to do that. <laughs> and uh, I believe Sherry mentioned earlier, we'll be sending a post meeting, post presentation email to everyone who's attended virtually and anyone who's here live, if you uh, give your email address to Sherry, she'll make sure you get on that email list. And when we're finished, we will send out a YouTube copy of this presentation. And we'll also share answers to questions like that, uh, which we can answer with the benefit of a little time for research. I have another virtual question. Seeing the slender cut of the dress, was the actual dress size ever determined? Um, no, it was not. My mother weighed about 99 pounds when she got married. And I know at one time we attempted to put it on a model to display it. And it was a size four model and we could not get the dress down over the hips mm. uh, of the model. So I would venture to say it's probably in today's world zero to two maybe <laughs> i would agree with that wendy i believe i have her on a women's two form um so i think you're right on the money with that and again with comparing size to what our sizes are today a lot of times our modern forms don't work for these older styles and that's not because everybody was smaller and shorter back then it's just you know, the way garments are cut. And the 40s were really all about that slim, narrow silhouette. Um, so, but I would say that what you said about size two is probably pretty accurate. Okay. Well, I think what we're gonna do now is Sherry is gonna use the iPad to share some close-ups of the dress. You may all continue to ask questions and I'll monitor those questions, but uh, the screen will primarily show the dress. So you will not see Wendy and I, at least, and you won't see Katie as close up because we're gonna focus screen attention to the dress now. Katie or Wendy, is there anything you would like Sherry to focus on in particular to show our audience? I think there was some interest in seeing the tiara on the veil. Um, that is of the nylon rip cords of the parachute fashioned into a looped braided tiara headband. Um, so that's a really interesting detail where you can see it's clearly a parachute being repurposed um, in this manner. And we can see the ruffle around the neck and the waist. That's very classic 1940s. They call that princess cut. Um, so those ruffles would have stood up a little bit higher when brand new, but they still add something nice to the dress today. It does not have a very long train. Um, even though the, the skirt of it is cut in a way in which it would give it somewhat of a train, um, but long, long trains were not super, super common in this period. And Wendy had mentioned the tatting. It's just this very, very fine trim right at the edges of the ruffles. Um, even if you go down a little bit more, just on the very edges, it's a little hard to see virtually, but uh, just again, another little 
detail. And they didn't, Wendy, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this. They didn't have too, too long to plan this wedding. By the time your father came home from the army and they got married was a period from about March to June. Correct. So this dress would have been made, you know, fairly quickly. Again, not uncommon for wartime weddings, but there is a lot going on with it, despite that. What is the veil made of? Full. Full netting. We have another question from our virtual audience. Someone asks, would this have had a petticoat under it to give some volume to the skirt? There is a slip underneath. It is just as narrow as the rest of the dress itself. So the volume was really meant to be on the hips there and around the neck with that ruffle, um, but not really anywhere else. This was not the era of the poofy skirt as we would see later in the 50s. Are there any other questions from our in-person audience or our virtual audience? Yes. Is there, a, is there a zipper in that? I mean, we had talked about zippers. Yes, there is a side zipper. The question was whether there were zippers. There are two side zippers. I believe they're on the other side, um, both in the same place. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit under her arm, but it is there right on the side. You can see where it's puckered there. That's where the zipper is. Another question, was the parachute fabric always this white or was there any dyeing involved? Sometimes, like I mentioned, that some brides, uh, I've seen, personally seen a parachute bridesmaid's dress that was pink and purple. Um, so the material silk is very, very easy to dye. Um, so there was some of that going on for kind of that bridal accessorizing type of thing. Um, it, this would not have worked so well for the camouflage version. Um, so generally, we just see these dresses being made from the white or off-white parachutes. Okay. Well, I see it's now one o'clock. So I think we will wrap up our program for today. But again, be on the lookout for our email next week, our post presentation email, which we'll be sharing with everyone that attended. For those of you in the virtual audience, we will say farewell to you and thank you again and encourage you to join us for more presentations. Um, for those of you who are here still. Thank you very much.